Good morning, everyone. I also want to say good morning to those who are joining us in our venue, those in the gym, those who join us online, and also hello to you who will be listening on a podcast later. Big week, wasn't it? As a church, I want us to reflect the kingdom of God in our communities. And I also know that we're part of our community. And so in a sense, our church will reflect our community, and that's okay. And as we looked, and as I looked at the results of the election this past week, uh, it's, it's very clear that in our area of West Michigan, that Donald Trump had a, um, what's the word, a handsome victory. And so it's logical to surmise that a great number of people from our church cast their vote for Donald Trump. Not everybody, but if we reflect our community, then a great many of us did. And so I'm, I'm willing to bet a lot of us are thinking right now, what does this all mean? What's going to happen? What are we supposed to do now? Let me give you an old cliche that I still think is an appropriate thing to say. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And you know, when you look at the Bible, it's pretty clear that between now and when God brings fulfillment to all things, and at the end when he makes all things as it should be, from now until then, the Bible's pretty clear. It's not going to be all roses, right? And while the Bible does an amazing thing in that it gives us eternal security, it also gives us a very sober reality. I'm going to tell you something right now. I always know what to do and where to go. And so do you. Christians in the house, we are always to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. That's what we are always supposed to do, and that's where we're always supposed to go. When it goes our way, and when it doesn't, we pick up our cross, and we follow Jesus. But I'm going to tell you right now, the devil will tempt you with your greatest desire and your greatest fear to get you off that path. I know that because that's exactly what he does to Jesus Christ. So as we finish up our sermon series on the temptation of Jesus, we're going to look at the final temptation that, that the devil brings to Jesus. So I'm going to ask you, if you would now, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Jump down to verse 8. If you picked up one of our Bibles as you walked in, that's on page 1028. So go ahead and start turning there now. In both temptations that we've looked at in the previous weeks, in both of those temptations, Jesus defeats, he overcomes those temptations, if you remember, by relying on the scriptures. Jesus goes back to the Bible when things get tough, and so should we. But now, in this temptation, Satan throws off the charade of trying to get Jesus to prove something. He's left that, and now he's going to propose something to try to get Jesus off course. So let's read God's word, and then we'll get started. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 to 11. It'll be up on the screen if you want to follow along there. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is the word of the Lord, everyone. Let's pray and then we'll, we'll dive in. Fathers, we come to you this morning. Half of our country is in celebration. Half of our country is in concern. Yet again, we're faced with the great divide of this nation. And so I pray, Father, that as we have been praying and as we will continue to pray, that our hope and our trust is not in princes or kings or presidents, but only you. And so, Father, I pray that you would draw 
all people to yourself, from people on both sides of the aisle, from people at the, on the right, left, and in the middle. You draw us all to yourself that we may find a unity, not in a political figure, but in our personal Savior. And so, Father, we ask, and I would ask, even now that you, that you would work in the heart of Donald Trump and Joe Biden. I ask that you would call both men to pick up their cross and to follow your son, yes, for their salvation and also for the good of our nation. And so, Father, we pray these things in the name of your son and through the power of your spirit. Please speak to us now. It's in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 So in this sermon series, we've been talking about temptation, but here's my concern. Here's my fear. I'm worried that a lot of people in here, when they heard temptation, they thought this doesn't apply to me. Because when you heard the word temptation, I think a lot of us, we automatically go to this notion of being tempted to cheat on our spouse or to look at naughty pictures online. And we think, well, I'm not tempted like that. Here's what I want to say to you. This idea of temptation applies to every single one of you and me included because temptation in many ways is the precursor to sin when you find yourself in sin it's because you were first tempted to go there and so when we look at Jesus and the way that he confronted temptation all of us have something to learn here and normally we don't go through a passage, like phrase by phrase like this. We, we do like to dive deep into scripture. Uh, but this idea of Jesus going face to face with Satan, we don't see that a lot in scripture. So we wanted to walk through it very slowly. So we're going to go through this almost phrase by phrase. So here we go. Here's how this passage starts. Again, the devil took him. Again, as in the third time. As in the devil won't stop trying to tempt you. He will come again and again and again. And it says the devil took him. Took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Listen, this, this is temptation at its finest. Just, just try to imagine this. Try being at the top of a mountain and seeing all the kingdoms and all the cities of the entire world in their glory. This had to be an overwhelmingly beautiful sight in all their glory. Temptation at its finest. It says, the uh, the Bible says that he, he showed him, the devil showed Jesus. This is why the devil is the master of tempters. He's going to show you your temptation. He will put it in arm's reach. He'll let you smell it. He'll bring you up close, which is why Christians need to be walking not just close to the Spirit, but in step with the Spirit. For when we walk in step with the Spirit, the devil will have a real hard time getting us off path. He showed Jesus not just the beauty of Jerusalem and Rome, but all the cities of all the world in their glory. And this reminds us that some, sometimes the things that we are tempted, tempted with, they are things that are beautiful in and of themselves. It doesn't mean that thing is an evil thing. We can be tempted with things that are truly beautiful. Have you seen some of the cities at night with all their lights shining into the night sky? It's beautiful. You're not always tempted with evil things. God can tempt you with good things that, you're, that you, he can lead you into for the wrong reasons. But he showed them all the cities of all the world in all their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Now we have to stop and ask two questions about this verse. This is really, this is really kind of the centerpiece of verse here. What's happening here? Why is this the most alluring of all the temptations? So we need to clear up two questions before we move forward about this particular verse. First, Was this actually Satan's to give? Could he have given away the kingdoms of the world? Which leads us to the second question is, why is this the hardest of the three temptations that we've looked at? All these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. So first, was this Satan's to give? So this story that we're looking at in the book of Matthew is also told in the book of Luke. And in the book of Luke, we see something about this this verse. In in Luke's account, the devil says this. He says, I will give you all of this. And then Luke adds this part. For it has been delivered to me, and I may give it to whom I choose. 
So is this accurate? Does or did the devil have possession, authority, dominion over the cities and the kingdoms of the earth? Could Satan have delivered on this proposal? The answer is no. No. This is not Satan's to give. Let me give you just one verse of many. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Now, you may be saying for, to me for a moment, hold on a second, Pastor Ryan. I've done some Bible study here. Uh, doesn't the New Testament call Satan the ruler of this, word and, of this world and the God of this world? It does a couple times, actually. Um, John chapter 12 calls Satan the ruler of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 calls Satan the God of this world. But like all things with Scripture, we must know the context. With verses like these, it's important to understand not what ruler or God mean here, but what the Bible means about the world. I wish I could spend more time on this, but the word world in Scripture is used in many different ways. But when speaking about the devil and other demonic powers over the world, the Scriptures are not talking about ownership or authority, but rather systems and influence The devil rules, meaning he exerts his influence over the broken systems of the world, but he does not own it. Satan is active in this world, tempting Christians to sin, leading people away from Jesus. So no, no, the kingdoms of this world are not Satan's to give. It should be no surprise to us here that Satan is lying. Jesus calls him the father of lies. But listen to me, this is how temptation normally works. Satan offers you something that's not his to give or yours to have. This is just tried and true temptation. But we all know that doesn't diminish the power of temptation. Temptation can still be very powerful. So the second question is, is why is this the hardest of temptations for Jesus? This is why. Because Satan was offering Jesus a path to glory that did not go through the cross. Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth to save us from our sins, to save us from the righteous judgment that we most certainly deserve. Jesus came from heaven to earth to save us from hell, but that was only accomplishable By dying on the cross. That is what Jesus came to do. He came to be the the perfect sacrifice for us. He came to live a sinless life so that he could be the perfect sacrifice. Jesus went to the cross not to be the great example of selflessness. While he definitely shows us that, the great point of the cross is that Jesus was the sacrifice for our sins, that he paid the penalty that we should have paid, but he did it knowing that we could never do it. He did it for us. But if you know Jesus, if you read the Gospels, you know that the idea of the cross terrified him. This was his greatest fear. The night before he was to be nailed to the cross, Jesus Christ was so nervous, his body developed a condition called hematidrosis. And this is where under extreme duress, the blood vessels in your sweat glands will actually rupture and you will literally sweat blood. That's how nervous Jesus was. Hours before the cross, Jesus was praying in a garden when this happened. And this was his prayer. His prayer was this, Father, if there is another way, let it be so. He prayed this while sweat and blood fell off his face. And then he said these most powerful words. He said, but not my will, but yours be done. Our Savior was scared, but he was still going to save us. The devil tempted Jesus with a path to glory that went around his greatest fear. It's like the devil pulled Jesus aside and was like whispering into his ear. I know what scares you. I know what's ahead for you. It doesn't have to be this way. 
I can bring you another way. I won't bring to you the pain that your father wants to bring on you. I can show you another way. Just fall down and worship me, and I can take care of it all. Just fall down and worship me, and you won't have to hang on the cross. That was the temptation. The temptation to go off a path that God had laid out for him. He just offered Jesus all the kingdoms of all the world, and he tried to make it sound like it was just for a small act of worship. That, my friends, is the power of temptation. The devil will lead you to believe that the cost is minimal. The devil will lead you to believe that temptation is a, only a momentary delight, but he won't share with you the devastating effects it will bring on your house and family. Just a few minutes. Just a few minutes looking at pornography. Who cares? Just a few minutes. Everyone does it. Not knowing that those few minutes will scar your wife's heart for the rest of her life. Let alone bring a shame and a guilt on your soul that you will have to now bear. A momentary delight can lead to a lifelong devastation. And that is temptation. And that is sin. It offers, but it only takes and do you know, like, do you know what, the, what was really going on here? Do you know what the trade really was being set up? Do you know what Satan was actually trying to do here? Let me explain what was happening here. The devil wanted to trade the kingdoms of the world so that he, the devil, could get the kingdoms of the world. If Jesus had taken that deal, Jesus would not have received the kingdoms of the world. Satan would have. Because there would be no salvation for us, only damnation. You see, our salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone and his work on the cross and his triumph over Satan and sin and death. And our faith is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let me be clear. Salvation is a free gift from God given to us through our faith in Jesus. You can do absolutely nothing to earn your salvation. Salvation wholly and fully belongs to Jesus the Lord and what he's done for us. Because that is what he came to earth to do. There is no separating Jesus from the cross. That is what he came to earth to do, to be the sacrifice for our sins, to pay the penalty that we could never pay. We could never do this on our own. It had to be Jesus, and the devil knew it. And that's why the devil literally threw the world at this temptation, to try and get Jesus around a path, to try and get Jesus on a path around the cross. And listen, this is not just the cross of Jesus Christ. This is the cross section of human history. This is the most important thing that has ever happened. And the devil knew it. That's why he brought the greatest temptation of all time to try to stop it. But the devil brought it with a lie. But he brought it to the author of truth. And Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. With the other two temptations that we looked at, Jesus immediately responds by saying the words, It is written. And he will here too. Jesus first responds here by addressing Satan with his personal name. Why? Why did, Satan, why did Jesus take this path? Here's why. Because the hardest temptations need the hardest rebukes. He says, be gone, Satan. Now, I want to teach you this phrase as it was originally written in the Greek form that we find in scriptures. The, the Greek that the Bible is written in is known as Koine Greek, common Greek. So I'm going to teach you this phrase. It's only two words. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the gift of speaking in tongues, so I can't teach you that, but I can teach you biblical Greek. So when temptation comes your way, I want you to have something to say something powerful to say, something that Jesus Christ himself said. Be gone, Satan. Three words in English, two words in Greek. Here it is. Hupage satana. Hupage satana. Listen to me say it one more time, and then I'm going to have you say it with me. Hupage satana. Say it with me. 
Hupage Satana. One more time. Say it with me. Hupage Satana. Now listen here. When you say this, I don't want you to say it with attitude, but I do want you to say it with authority. Hupage Satana. This is what Jesus said when faced with his greatest temptation. That's what I want you to say when you are faced with temptation. A couple years ago, when my kids were, my kids are still kind of little, but when they were really little, uh, we were in our backyard playing. Now, out in the country, we know our neighbor's dogs, right? And they come over to our yard every now and again and whatever. But I was out in my backyard with my kids a couple years ago, and this dog came that I did not know. It was a pure white pit bull. And it was coming, not super aggressive, but it definitely wanted to check us out. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think when I saw this, that I stood there and said, be gone, foul beast, lest I smite you with my 22? No, I mean like, (laughs) no, what did I say? I said, get out of here. Go on, get like that's, that's the grit that I want you to say when you say hupage satana. When he comes, when you're alone with your phone, men, you say hupage satana. When that gossip train comes through your ears, it can stop with you. Hupage satana. Be gone, Satan. We are not your children. We are children of the king. We don't play on your playground. We got a different glory that's meant for us. Hupage satana, we say what Jesus says. Jesus rebuked the devil. But because Jesus lived by the scriptures, there wasn't just a rebuke. Jesus, like every temptation, responds with this. For it is written. It is written. Three of the most powerful words that you will find in all the scriptures. It is a Jewish declaration of scriptural authority. And for those of of you who have been with us for every sermon in this sermon series, have you noticed how Jesus encounters the devil three different times, but with each different time, the devil takes a different angle? But yet Jesus responds the same way, no matter what angle the devil takes. Jesus responds by leaning on Scripture. He goes back to the Bible. It is written Jesus responds with truth because that is our weapon against the devil and his lies and his temptations. Jesus says, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Again, for the third time, Jesus quotes the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 13. And I made, I made this point last week and I think it bears repeating here. Jesus doesn't get into an argument Choose wisely what you choose to argue over. And you know what I'm talking about right now. Choose wisely what you choose to argue over. Jesus Christ himself was face to face with the prince of all the demons in his face. And the devil is twisting scripture and Jesus refrains from getting in a theological debate. I mean, if there was ever a time I'd like to see something like that happen, it would have been here. But Jesus don't give that to us, does he? He just stops it with truth. He doesn't say, now Satan, we both know that these kingdoms are not yours to give. In fact, if you go to Psalm 24, you'll read that the the earth belongs to the Lord. In fact, Satan, you know what? Here, if we also go, I'm in Deuteronomy. There's other verses in Deuteronomy that support the fact that you do not have dominion. God has dominion over this universe. No, Satan does, or Jesus does not get into an argument with Satan. What does Jesus do? He just responds with truth. I'm not going to worship you, Satan, because the Bible says I'm to worship God and him alone. And I'm going to do what the Bible says. And then what happens? I love this part. Then the devil left him. Amen. Then the devil left him. Imagine that. Truth. Truth. See, Jesus models for us what we read elsewhere in James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7 says this. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 
So you can't just resist the devil. You have to first submit to God. And Jesus shows us what that means. That means submitting to scriptural authority. Res- submit to God, then resist the devil, and then he will flee from you. Because Jesus does this right here. He submits to God by pointing to a verse that shows his submission to God. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. You know, in Luke's, Luke's record of this interaction, uh, after this phrase, the devil left him, Luke adds another little phrase here that Matthew leaves out. In Luke's account, it says, Then the devil left him until an opportune time. Again, reminding us that the devil won't stop. This is his life's mission. To disrupt what God has for you. To disrupt the, to disrupt the plan and the path that God has for you. Temptation is a lifelong thing. The devil may leave you, but he will come back. And when he comes back, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then we're left with this last phrase that we'll look at from this sermon series. And behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. Don't get, don't get tripped up on this word ministering. It's not like the angels came and were preaching the gospel to Jesus. That's not what ministering means. The word ministering actually means serving in the name of the Lord. So they just came and they were serving Jesus in the name of the Lord. But I love this line. And behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. I'm going to tell you why this is so important to me. I'm going to, but I'm going to confess something right now. I, I think somebody in here, or maybe someone I'm watching, watching online, really needs to hear what I'm about to say. Why is this so important for us to hear? This is why. Because even after Jesus defeated temptation, he still received help. Just because you have defeated temptation or addiction, or you've ended that affair. It does not mean you are now perfect. You still need help. Jesus Christ was perfect, and he triumphed over Satan, sin, and death, and he still got help. Jesus still receives help. It's okay to get help. It's okay to receive help. And we as a church, we should be a help. As a church, we are a bunch of imperfect people that God calls to minister to one another and to our community. Two weeks from today, I will assume the honor of becoming the the next lead pastor of Peace Church. And I'm here to tell you, I will need help. I will need people ministering to me as I minister in the name of the Lord. And I am thankful for those of you who do and who will continue to do that. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had lunch with a guy, and uh, we're having lunch, and he, he says this to me. He says, man, I just love Peace Church. He says, man, I love, I love your preaching. I love you. I love the team. We just got awesome ministries. We got wonderful people there. I just love Peace Church. I'm thinking, oh, that's pretty cool. I do too. And he goes, there's just one thing I don't like. I'm thinking, okay, here we go. I'm gonna, I wrote down what he said because it was so good. He said this. He said, it's too easy for people to come and go and feel like they're doing church, but they're really not. Whew. Ouch. Listen, I, just, I sat back and I thought, hmm. Well, on the one hand, I do want us to have an open door where anyone is welcome to come to Peace Church. And we're not a cult, so people are welcome to leave whenever they want. But here's what I'm going to say. I'm just going to break down this fourth wall here and, and just call it out. We all know that COVID is allowing a great shuffling of Christians right now. We're figuring out what we're going to do and where we're going to be coming out of this. And so let me just tell you about Peace Church. We are not a grocery store. We're not a place that you're meant to visit on a regular basis and pick up what you need and then go home. We are family here. And every family member got a chore. You want to be a part of Peace Church? Praise God. To be a part of Peace Church means to be involved. 
at Peace Church. And I want to stop right here because I think there's a lot going on in our world. And there's a lot of hurt in our world right now. And sadly, some of that hurt does come from church experience. And so there may be some people who need to come and just sit and be ministered to for a while. They're coming from a place of hurt or being disenfranchised, and they need to come and just sit and be ministered to and let us serve you and let us feed you with the word of God. Please, we want to be a place of rest and healing. But it's not always meant to be like that. That's a season that we want to get you through so that we can get you back on your feet and serve it in the name of the Lord. So as we close up this sermon series, I want to end with looking at what Jesus has just done in this temptation as a model for us. I'm going to summarize it like this. This temptation, this temptation shows us this. Jesus chose the path of the cross. That's what this temptation shows us. Jesus chose the path of the cross, and he calls us to do the same. I'm going to jump ahead a few chapters in Matthew. You don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll put it up on here. But I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 24. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned, to Peter, but he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You may not know what to do or where to go, but I'm here to tell you, yes, you do. You take up your cross and you follow Jesus. Whether it was a disciple or Satan himself, if someone tried to get Jesus off the path that God had laid out before him, Jesus gave his strongest rebuke. He says to Peter, his best friend, Get behind me, Satan. That's how seriously Jesus took his life and his mission. And throughout this series, we have talked about how Jesus had to go through this temptation. Because now we have a God who has walked in our shoes. The God who has been there. Who's walked this path before us and he walks with us still. And because he did, he now calls us to deny, to deny ourselves and to take up our cross and to follow him. Why? Why? Because let me tell you clearly right now, you will lead yourself astray. You are already inclined to certain desires and the devil is just going to lead you there. You will lead yourself astray. That's why we need to deny ourselves. Temptation's path to our heart is through ourselves. So when we remove that avenue, when we deny ourselves, temptation cannot get at us. Jesus denied himself. He said, I will not choose the path of safety. I will choose the path of sacrifice. We need to, like Jesus, be led by the Spirit as we lean into Scripture, just like our Lord so that whether temptation or the tempter himself comes, that you will, like Jesus, deny yourself. And if you do, temptation will have no influence over you. Because you're not walking your path, you're walking the path of the cross. If the temptation of Jesus Christ reminds us of anything, it's that we have a faithful Savior who has himself defeated temptation. He has defeated the tempter, and he has walked this road before us. And I want to remind you, when times get tough, he is walking with you still. He is the God who has been there, and he is the God who is there. For Jesus Christ, he chose to take up his cross, and it ended with his sacrifice for our salvation. But when we take up our cross and we stand against temptation, do you know what we're doing? We're showing the world that the devil offers nothing but lies. But what we offer is the truth. The devil offers sin. Jesus offers life. 
The devil offers damnation. We offer salvation. And that's what we show the world when we choose the path of the cross. You're not going to sacrifice yourself. You're just walking the path of your salvation. Listen, I don't know. I don't know what the cost of the future is going to be for any single one of you. But I do know that Jesus has already paid it all. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we just ask, Lord, that here and now that you would be with us as we come before you. We ask, Lord, that you'd give us by the power of your spirit, Lord, the insight, the passion, and the desire not to sin, but the desire to take up our cross and to follow you. And so, Lord, I just ask, Lord, that here and now that you would empower us as your people to go and stand for truth in this world. And I pray, Lord, that we do it in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Would you stand right now? Before we go to worship, I want us to read the prayer together that Jesus himself taught us to pray. It'll be up on the screen if you don't know it. If you don't know it, that's fine. Can you read this with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you believe that, let me hear you sing it.